All right, so now I think it's a good time to actually start working on like an admin page where you have like some input boxes and maybe a button that you can click save or submit. And that'll create a post and put it into Mongo for us so that it'll show up on our homepage without having to actually like go into the Mongo shell down here and type it in. All right, so let's pretend that we have another page called like admin or something. So I'm just gonna go ahead and make a page called admin, HTML. And that's gonna be very similar to, let's just copy the index file for right now, but we can kind of style it as we want. Um, so instead of loading in index.js, I'm gonna load in an admin.js. So admin.js. And so what we can do is if we go to our admin page, go to admin.html, we can actually start putting some like input boxes and stuff. So inside of the actual body, I'm gonna add a section and I'm gonna start putting like some labels. So we could put like title, go ahead and save that. Uh, we could put a text or an input. Remember we learned all these like HTML elements earlier on in this series, but we're just gonna basically start putting out a couple of, so we can actually put like some real post data. We got title, um, we can have like content that could be a text area instead of an input. And then we could also add, um, I think description was one. Let me add like description. That could also be a text area, I guess. I don't know if it, nah, let's make that an input. And then an image, right? So for image, let's just do input as well. But ultimately you probably wanna do like some type of image uploading ability, but that's way, way more advanced. And I think I'm not gonna do that in this series. Cool, so now we have a bunch of inputs and text areas. The styling looks pretty bad in all these. Um, so let's just try to style these real quick. I'm gonna say like label and input. They're both gonna be display of block. Okay, so that'll put them all in different lines. I'm gonna give the whole section a padding of 20 pixels just so it looks nicer, not so like bunched up on the edge. And then, you know, so this is the issue with, like I said, remember I talked about CSS where you can change the styling for something here and it messes up up here. Notice that the input box and the header is all messed up now because I'm doing a global styling of label and input. So let's just do this the correct way. And I'm gonna say like admin, I'll just add a class of admin here. And then instead, I want to basically style the admin to be, have some padding. And then I only want the labels and inputs of admin to be changed. So let me go ahead and kind of change that a little bit. I think I can just do this. No, okay. I'll target the admin of input as well. All right, so that looks a little bit better. Um, after all the input boxes and text areas, what I wanna do is I want to, let me add text area as well. I'm gonna add some margin to all these, right? So input and text area, I'm gonna say margin bottom is 20 pixels, just to space that out a little bit. And then we can also kind of increase the width and the font size of all these. So I'm gonna say font size is like 18 pixels for that. And then for this and that, we could do like padding of four pixels. All right, so it doesn't look that great but I think it's a good start. And then this could be like a width of like 100%. We're gonna need some more like typing area as we're writing our blog post. So let's just add some width of like 100% in height of 400. And then finally, we probably need like a submit button. So I'm gonna add a button here. I'll like save post. That should show up down at the bottom. And now we have a really bare bones basic page, but Again, I'm just trying to show you the functionality. I'm not trying to focus too much on styling because that's something you can kind of learn on your own. So one thing we want to do is we want to wrap all this in a form. So all that all the values of the inputs we can kind of fetch. So it's important to put on all the inputs like a name. So I'm going to say name of title. I'm going to say name of description. Did I spell it right? Description. Yep. Uh, name of content and then also a name of image 
And that's basically so that when we click save and try to submit the form, um, it's going to basically get all that information for us and put it into a nice form data object. So I'm going to also add a type submit to this button. All right, so what we can do is the form is pretty much ready, right? We have a form with inputs and text areas and a button. And what we want to do is whenever the user clicks on the submit, we want to do a request to the back end to basically store that information. OK, so let's start moving on to our JavaScript. And what we can do is we can listen to the form. So I'm going to add a class here. <clears throat> Actually, I'm just going to add a, an ID. I'll call it form and so that we can access it. Again, if you wanted to do this properly, um, you probably want to do document.query selector or get element by ID. Maybe I should just start doing that so that you all can see the proper way of doing it. So if I wanted to get the form, I could do this. So document.get element by ID. And we want to add an event listener to the form so that when someone tries to submit it, we want to do that fetch request to the back end. Right? So I'm going to say form.add event listener. And this is like a new function that we haven't seen before that's basically in all DOM elements. This is how you can listen for click events or keyboard strokes or like form submissions. You basically just take the DOM element, you call the function add event listener, and then you need to pass it your event, right? So the event key that we're looking for is called submit. And when someone submits, we are going to call a function here, right? So I think this takes in an E and we just can print out an E real quick and see this, see if this works. So usually what happens with the form is when you click it, it actually is going to refresh your page, right? So we kind of just saw that where it just refreshed the page. Um, what we want to do is we want to do an e dot prevent default so that the page doesn't refresh when we submit the form. All right, so you can see here as I click on save posts, that's going to basically print out that e event uh, the, and the page isn't going to get reset basically. So at this point, what we need to do is we need to get all of the form data names and values, right? Remember how we added names to all these? There's a way to actually get the values back that were typed into the input boxes. And you can do something called new form data. So let me just go ahead and put like const data is equal to new form data of e.target. And let's print out data and see what happens. So if I were to just type in some random characters into all this and click submit, Uh, I need to refresh my page actually. Let me do this. So when I submit, you'll notice that it prints out form data, but this happens to be like an empty object. If you wanted to get the individual names, you actually have to do like a dot get. And I could say like get dot get a title. And now if I refresh and type in like hello into the title, and click submit, you'll notice that it prints out the hello string. All right, so this form data object has like all of the values that we need, and we can actually just send that over to the back end. Um, so I did find this little snippet online. We're going to try to follow this approach. But if we pretend like there's a back end that exists that can take in this form data, I'm going to go ahead and just pretend like that exists. So I'm going to say localhost 3000 slash posts. And we are going to basically pass that form data inside of the body here. So one thing I didn't talk about was request methods. So when you do a request, there's different like attributes you can attach to the header. Um, by default, anything that you open up in your Chrome tab is going to do a git request. Uh, that's called, also related to why we did like app.git. There's also a couple of other ones. There's like a post request, there's a put request, there's a patch request, there's a de delete request. And for all those different methods, you can actually listen for that. So I could do like an app dot post. And whenever someone does a post request to slash posts, we can invoke a different function here, right? So let me go ahead and do that rack and res. And let's just print out what rec dot body is. All right, so now on our front end, we're doing that fetch request and we're telling it to do a post method. And then we're also saying send that form data over. So if I were to basically type in some random things here and click submit, 
That should hit our back end, but I'm not sure our back end is fully going to work just yet. We shall see in a second. I think I forgot to refresh my <laughs> my index file. So let's try this. We'll click Save Posts. You'll see here it did a post request to our REST API. And if you look at the headers here, I haven't really showed you this, but there's a headers tab and there should be a request method that's defined somewhere down here. Um, okay, here's the method. So if you see it says method post, that actually tells us like what type of request method it was. By default, there's a lot of gits. So you see git, 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 git. But this one happened to be a post. And let's see, I, th I thought it's in the header somewhere, but I could be wrong. And then secondly, if you look at the very bottom, there is a form data section. And you'll see that form data that we sent in is actually being passed to the backend as well. All right, so it, it turns out when you submit this form, our backend is going to print undefined for the body. And that is because Express doesn't know how to, by default, handle multi-part uploads. So if you see here, if you look at the headers in the request, it says multi-part form data. Um, so we need to actually install a plugin to be able to handle that request. So I'm going to install something called um, Multer. I'll say npm install save Multer. And by using Multer, you can actually process multi-part form data. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and say const multer is equal to require multer. So once you require multer, you can actually just say like const upload is equal to multer and call it as a function. And on your endpoint itself, the one that you need to handle the multi-part upload, you can go and put a another argument in between like the URL and your callback function. And you could say upload of none. All right, so that's basically going to allow the middleware, which is called Multer, to basically process your request, extract all the form data so that you can actually access it on your body. So let's try this again. Let's try clicking Save or Submit. And you'll notice that when we print out the body, we get back the title, the description, the content, and the image. So at this point, it should probably make sense as to what we need to do next. We need to take this data and we need to store it into Mongo and then maybe tell the UI that everything goes good so it can redirect to the home page. All right, so inserting data into Mongo is something that we haven't done yet. But if you go back to the Mongo docs, um, you can just find an insert one method if you want. And you could probably just pass it what it's asking for. So basically, you just pass it the document and that's about it. So we are going to basically do the same thing we've been doing in the other endpoints. We're going to grab the collection. And then we're going to say collection.insert. And we're going to pass it rec.body, right? We're going to pass the exact same form data that we passed in from the front end and just store that into Mongo. And remember, since this is a promise, we can await on it. And if everything was good, it should hopefully return us some data back. So I'm going to say like post is equal to that and print that out just so that we kind of see what is going on here. And then like always need to actually send something back. So I'm going to say res.json of post. Hopefully this um, works as we want it to. Let's see. Oh, await doesn't work. This is an error you'll see. If you see it underlying await and saying await is only valid in async function, just remember to go back and add async here. All right, so let us go ahead and try submitting again. And you'll see that it actually submitted. Everything worked fine. The post came back with some information. And the thing that we're printing out here is actually like a MongoDB insert record, which has a lot of extra information we don't really care about. What we actually want to send back to the user is ops of zero. Our ops is a property on the object that happens to be an array that has one object in it. So what we want to return is that first insert record. So let's resave that and try to submit one more time. And you'll see back, we get back the full post that was created. Um, and what we actually want to try to do in the front end is if everything worked fine, we're going to get back an ID. And it'll probably make sense to redirect the user to the post we just created. So I'm going to go back to the admin.js file. And on this fetch method, if you remember, this is a promise. So we can actually do an async await on this. I'm going to say, async, I could say await, 
is response. And then I'm going to say const uh, post is equal to a weight of response.json. And then what we could try to do is console log the post here to make sure that everything is working fine. Let me go ahead and refresh this page. I'm going to type some content like this. Click save. You notice that we get back the actual full post. But this also has an underscore ID attached to it. We're going to use that ID to redirect the user to the post that we just created. So how you can do that is you can say window.location.href is equal to. And for right now, we're just going to say dot slash post of HTML. And then we are going to basically do some string interpolation to say post of underscore ID. I think this should work. We might have to put the full URL here, but let's just see. So after we make the post and everything worked fine, um, it actually did not redirect us. Uh, let's see what's going on here. I think, did I forget the refresh my page? I, th I probably forgot to refresh my page. So I'll click save and notice that that redirected me back to the post I just created. Let me try that again. Um, so I could put like some H1 here and say this is my title. Let me zoom in for you all. All right, so this is my title, H1, and then paragraph tag is this is a paragraph. And close that paragraph tag off. My awesome post, not power. <laughs> um, my awesome post is awesome. And images, we'll do like JavaScript slash or dot slash images slash JavaScript dot JPEG. So I think if everything works fine, it should save this post. It should redirect us to this post. And now if we go back to like our home page, which happens to be index.html, uh, index.html, we will see that we have all of these posts that have been saved and are showing up on our dashboard now. So there's one thing that's bothering me is that the header, when you click on my blog, this should really take you back to like your home page. So I'm actually going to wrap this in an H tag and just go to like index.html. And that will make the use, that'll make the site kind of easier to use because it's always good to have like your logo go back to the home page. All right. So now we can actually like go back to the home page if we've nav navigated to a post. Also go back like that. All right, so the last thing I want to do in this series, I think I'm going to wrap this series up. Um, this might be the last video, is having all of this stuff kind of just nested in your project can be kind of um, ugly. And often what we do if we're using like Express is that we have like a folder that contains all of our public facing index files and JavaScript files and CSS. So inside of Express, so let me actually close out of some of these tabs. We have so many open right now. Inside of Express, there is a way to do static file hosting. Um, so I'm going to Google that because I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, but what you can do is if we go back to our server file, you can do app.use express static, and you can basically pass it a folder that you want to basically have all of the assets hosted at, right? So if I call this middleware function and pass it the string of public. This is going to basically tell Express that it needs to look for a public folder. And inside that public folder, just go ahead and host any files that happen to be in it, right? So in that case, we could probably move the styles there. We can move the JavaScript files there. We can move the in images there. About admin and index and post could all be moved into the top level of that. And now our project structure is a little bit cleaner. We know where the server is and we know where all the public static assets are. Now, the cool thing about doing this is that now I can actually access my index file by going to localhost 3000, and you'll see that our index file loads up. Everything seems like it's working good. I can navigate to my post page. I can go back to my home page. I can go to my about page. All of that is being hosted from Express now instead of it being hosted from like me opening it in my Chrome browser. Okay, so now. I can take this express package and I can basically host it somewhere. I could put it on a server. I could run it on a server. There's a lot of services out there where you can basically take this express package, 
put it to a GitHub repo, and then tell that service to basically deploy your Express app, okay? Um, there's also a ton of different ways you can do this. Like if you're doing like a Jamstack approach, you could deploy all of your static assets separately and then have your public API running uh, in a separate deploy. I was really debating how much longer I should take this series. Like how much could I keep adding on features? Um, I do want to wrap this series up. I think I covered a good amount of content and material just to kind of get your hands wet with learning how to build like a full stack application using vanilla JS. At this point, I would recommend that you continue to try to build on functionality to this. Like for example, maybe you want to add the ability to edit a post. Right now there's only a way for an admin to create new posts, but maybe you want to add like a way to edit an existing post and have like the post data show up in the front end. They can go in and edit it and click update and that would reflect on your UI. You could also add the ability to delete posts. There's different HTTP methods like delete, where in your server you could do like an app.delete, listen for a delete call on a particular ID, and then figure out how to delete a collection um, or delete an entry from a collection of Mongo. Again, this tutorial wasn't to give you like a deep dive understanding of Mongo, a deep dive understanding of Express and front end vanilla JS applications. You can kind of take all the knowledge that I showed you here, and I hope you can apply it to your further studies down the road. But again, yes, be sure to keep on learning vanilla JS. I think if you were to be able to understand all this and continue to add on a couple of features to this blog, at that point, it might be a good idea to maybe switch over to a front end framework like Vue or React um, or Svelte. Honestly, Vue is really nice to use. I, I think it's very friendly for beginners because it really takes your HTML and your CSS and your JavaScript, puts it in a single file, and it makes it really under, like understandable. React is a little bit more confusing, but if you have the patience to learn React, um, there's a lot of jobs in React, so maybe check out React. Um, and then also you could start looking into like server-side rendering. Like, so the approach that I've been doing is basically like your front end can just grab data as it needs from your back end. But there's also a server side render approach where you can do templates and like inside your express application, you can fetch the data from your backend and then kind of render out a template using that data. Um, I think Pug is something that Express uses. Um, but I think Express is kind of, you can kind of pull in whatever template language you want to express. I know Pug is one of them, but basically you can like dynamically render over lists or arrays using pug and then have that show up in your html you can look into like mustache or handlebars um, i would honestly just start learning view or learning react and then continue to build out like a restful api and have those two be separate and talking to each other um, but if you want you can try to look into next.js once you've learned react or nux.js that is a server-side rendering um, approach to these front-end frameworks well, cool. yeah, I'm just going to um, wrap up this whole series. I hope you guys learned something from this. Um, leave a comment below if you really wanted me to touch on some more subjects. But I think I kind of showed you like most of everything you might need. And right at this point, it's just like repeating the process, right? Rinse and repeat. You're going to make a new endpoint that can provide data. And your UI is going to hit that endpoint and display that data. That's really what web development boils down to. Um, it's just making forms, submitting forms, showing data. Uh, so I think I showed you like all the tools that you need to basically build out a larger scale application using at this point van vanilla JS. Um, and also, yeah, continue to look into like JavaScript and DOM manipulation because I didn't really touch on that too much. But you can see that with the things that I showed you in this series, like there's not that much that you need to know in JavaScript and DOM manipulation to get this working. Really, it's just like knowing how to change the inner HTML of a page or of DOM elements on the page and how to dynamically render out templates. And you can actually achieve quite a lot just doing that approach. There's often times that you need to add like click listeners to stuff so that you can dynamically fetch data if someone clicks on a button or hovers over a link or something. But really, we already talked about like doing an event listener on click, right? You could just do add event listener and do like click instead of submit. And then you can call whatever function you want. So it's like all the tools are there. I kind of showed you an overview of everything that you might need to use. And then if you ever get lost or you can't figure something out, there's 
thousands of resources out there that can help guide you, okay? So this whole series was just to kind of get your feet wet, get your hands dirty with building a full stack application. And now it's really up to you to take it further and to continue to learn as you can. All right, thank you so much for watching all. I hope you guys enjoyed this full stack tutorial series. Um, leave me a comment, give me a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe.